Welcome to the 6-5 Summit. Thank you for joining us. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners of Futurum Research. And on behalf of my team here at Futurum and the team at More Insights and Strategy, welcome. We're glad you're here. In this spotlight session, Futurum Research's Daniel Newman sits down with Grok fellow Igor Asovsky, and they talk about the challenges and the opportunities for the semiconductor industry, specifically relating to the AI landscape. Igor also explores how Grok's architecture will impact compute for customers across a wide range of industries. Without further ado, let's hear what they've got to say. We want to thank Accenture for sponsoring the semiconductor track of this year's 6-5 Summit. Igor, welcome to the 2022 6-5 Summit. So excited to have you join us. Glad to be with you, Daniel. So it's been a great show, big week, topics that are gonna be certainly near and dear to your heart, AI, data, semiconductors, all in focus here at the summit. But I have uh, wanted to start off with something a little bit fun with you. So most of the people that speak at our summit are a little long in the tooth at their current companies, meaning, you know, they've got some years under their belts. Um, you're pretty brand new over at Grok, coming yeah. in as its newest fellow. Just kind of give me the quick background, your story. How, how'd you land here? Yeah, yeah. So let me give you a quick one. Um, so I, I started uh, back at IBM in 2003. Uh, I started as a memory designer. Um, I quickly moved through the ranks um, and uh, ended up being the CTO of the ASIC business unit that ended up moving from IBM to Global Foundries first. And then it ended up as the ASIC business unit at Marvell. Um, now, during this time in the ASIC business unit, I actually first met Jonathan, the CEO of Grok. Um, in 2016, when he was uh, um, looking for an ASIC vendor to build his first chip, basically. This was the V1, or what he called Allen. Um, so since then, um, we basically got that chip, uh, uh, I think, manufactured and taped out in, in about, uh, in a very short time. I think the, from final netlist to tape out, it was about 13 months, and we had a first uh, time right silicon, which is currently shipping with the Grok customers. Um, since then, I kind of transitioned through a system company. So I worked for Google, uh, um, kind of running their Google Cloud technology development. So this was the group that was basically feeding uh, technology into the TPU, uh, the VPU, uh, and many different VUs that uh, are yet to be announced. Um, and then about two months ago or three months ago, Jonathan reached out to me um, and asked me to come join Grok. So um, I couldn't resist, and here I am, uh, two months at Grok right now. Well, from fairly you know significant experience working for some of the largest names in tech, it's probably a little bit of a different pace at Grok. Um, you know, joining the the a startup that's really trying to challenge in a field that really is open for um, some new innovators to come and be disruptive. There are some companies that are certainly seen as, as the leaders today. Um, and I think Grok wants to and sees itself as a very capable challenger. I remember talking to Jonathan last year at our summit in 21. He's also going to join us here. So hopefully all of you are going to tune into that session as well. But uh, I kind of like the lens that you're going to provide here, being fresh, uh, making a move from one of the world's largest cloud companies right now <laughs> over to Grok. Um, but AI is a big challenge. I mean, we are in a stage where it's becoming pervasive. Everybody uh, starting to understand that it's going to be part of our lives. There are very practical applications for AI, and there are some that are uh, often touted that are much further away in terms of truly being AI than what we're <laughs> And then the way they're often positioned in, in Hollywood or in movies or, but I'm curious, like through your lens as an engineer, as a designer that's building uh, Silicon, what do you see the big challenges facing the AI industry? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the biggest challenges are uh, just the sheer growth in, in model sizes. So these are the AI models are growing at an incredible pace. 
And if you try to match them to the growth of just transistors per chip, just to try to match those two, you'll find that there's a big divergence. I think uh, the doubling of models was happening. I don't know. There's there's speculations that anywhere from three months doubling to maybe a year or so that the models are doubling. Um, if you look at Moore's law, uh, we're not getting that type of scaling. Uh, we used to get it every 16 months. Uh, it's not longer the case. So I think that just uh, discrepancy between the model growth and the silicon kind of improvements is is, is a big challenge. So. Uh, what that drives is, is is better architectures. So how do you differentiate? Do you need to come up with a better architecture, something that's more friendly uh, to scaling into the next technology node or the next more than more scaling with chiplets and 3D stacking and things like that. Um, and um, there's other challenges that are, go beyond the chip level, right? Um, if you look at to handle some of the biggest models right now, data centers are deploying hundreds of thousands of SOCs working together to kind of uh, uh, train on a specific model or implement a specific inference. Um, this is no longer just a chip challenge. It's really coming up with a, with a primitive, like a chip that could be scaled in an efficient way, in an energy proportional way uh, to actually um, implement something, uh, something truly massive uh, from the aspect of like kind of uh, system development. Yeah, there seems to be an overwhelming, consistent answer from designers to implementers about the volume of data and the complexity that it brings, right? Uh, oftentimes, models are created using a limited subset because there's not enough processing power to process all the data. And certainly, as we add more data that's going to enter in real time, that adds more complexity. So, you know, continuous learning is, is a goal. But the movement of data is both expensive, it can be complicated, and it's not just a chip level problem, it's a fabric problem, a network problem, a compute problem. And it's also what's driving, I think, a lot of the disaggregation in semis. Yeah. Um, you, of course, have a lot of background in, in ASIC. You mentioned that you were basically been building them from the onset. Uh, you did it both on the cloud side, but also on the chips, you know, on the pure chip and cloud optimization side over at Morvell. But I'm curious, I want to kind of do a double a double back there because you said Jonathan called you and you just felt uh, you couldn't resist. I think it was the, the term you said. Someone's got to go back and play that and see if that was right. But the point is, is you basically said couldn't resist, came over to Grok. What, what, what convinced you? Because, you know, you were working at a company that's breaking things, moving fast, innovating, also uh, somewhere Jonathan was in his past, but with all your experience working somewhere that I'm sure in Google is going to be investing in building its own uh, silicon <laughs> more and more. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, you know, as we've seen that the, cl the cloud scale companies all building their own, why make this leap and do it at Grok? Why, what really drove you? What was the, what was the most convincing thing he said, or can you share that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, leaving Google was uh, was not an easy task. Just to, just to be fair, I was leading the the technology development group there, and it was really exciting to work on some of the biggest problems in the world. Um, what really pulled me towards Grok uh, is really the unique uh, approach to solving the problem that Jonathan has taken uh, with Grok. If I look at the architecture. It, it, it's a it's a different approach than most um, AI companies out there. Uh, everybody's kind of pushing down the path of a GPU-like architecture, multiple cores, um, all contending for the same uh, memory resource, all contending for the same um, uh, I/O resource, and and and. Uh, by doing that, you're creating the, these conflicts where these cores are needing to basically uh, fight for these resources. Um, what uh, what Grok has done is something unique. They've kind of started from scratch and they've gone down this path of this one core approach. They've removed all the arbiters, uh, they've removed all the caches, all the reactive type elements, which in the CPU world have become like a really a godsend for performance improvement. But for the ML world, this has become like a really uh, simple, clean architecture. Um, it's very uniform in nature, the chip. Um, the data movement is very, um, very short. As you mentioned earlier, data movement is a big problem where the power is coming from. So um, the chip looks like a, like a group of, uh, 
um, uh, effectively conveyor belts that are basically moving data and from east to west and then from north to south, there is instructions that are being issued executing these operations. Um, so that architecture looks really, really uh, interesting from just data movement and regularity, which is naturally scales well into next generation nodes. Um, but the biggest uh, delta, the, the biggest improvement that I see is this 100% determinism that is there behind every GROC architecture. And um, what that does is allows the software team to actually predict exactly what uh, operation will be executed in what operational functional unit uh, at every nanosecond of the operation. So basically, they have a full predictive view of what's happening on the chip. Now, you can say this is maybe not a big deal, but it is really understated. As we move to more and more advanced nodes and we're pushing higher and higher frequencies on chip, um, this determinism is actually key to predict how much current needs to be supplied to the chip uh, to avoid brownouts, and then how much uh, cooling and how much uh, operations can be issued to maintain under a specific thermal uh, power, basically, envelope. Um, that's not found in any of the other solutions that I've seen so far. And that to me is kind of key, especially as we move to this more than Moore's law, uh, it would allow significant improvement in, in performance and really predictable deterministic type outcomes out of the chip. Um, yeah, so that was really one of the big pulls for me, uh, to Grok. I really believe that the architecture has a, a lot of scaling potential and a lot of value moving forward. So... <laughs> I got to ask a follow on to that. It sounds to me like this would be materially a shift in data center, data center architecture, right? So this deterministic architecture would change a lot of things. It could have Im impacts on power envelope. It could have impacts on uh, even, you know, I know ESG is a popular topic, but if we're creating more efficiency or very being very deterministic, very specific, you could, I could see some benefits there. Of course, giving the adequate resources for what's required to compute a certain, uh, you know, a certain workload and to, to manage. I mean, what are some of the ways that you see this level of determinism really impacting the data center? Yeah, yeah. No, so I agree with you. Like at the chip level, you get these benefits where you can really manage the current that, that delivered to the chip to be matching the the requirements that you ask for the chip to execute. So you're kind of flattening out the current demand, really tightening down the power demand, and that there's not a lot of brownouts and overshoots in voltage, so you can actually really optimize power. At the data center level, um, this determinism allows you to really synchronize multiple chips to act like one giant core. So by all of these chips communicating at the same time and executing in a very deterministic fashion, you actually can get a lot more um, uh, communication, effective communication between chips, between C2Cs and IO, um, and kind of create this uh, really super chip in a, in a data center, something that, re that would have required a lot of synchronization between chips in non-deterministic nature. So what that does, it allows almost linear scaling uh, with the added number of chips uh, into the network. And I think we have an ISCA paper that's coming up in about a month. I think Dennis Abt, who is our chief architect at Grok, is going to be presenting uh, the details of that and uh, providing some hard data behind some of the statements I'm making right now. So I'm curious, as someone that is a developer, designer, going from big, bigger company to small, you know, you mentioned some of the specific things. What are the things kind of in the broader development of next generation silicon, uh, solving future challenges for AI. What are the things that really interest you? What are the types of, of projects, concepts, things that you're maybe working on or want to work on that interest you and that you think are going to have the biggest impact on the world? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... Yeah, so I think for me, the short term kind of optimization has always been to try to kind of tie up as much um, across the vertical stack. So uh, when you operate at the chip company, you kind of optimize the chip and you kind of stop at the, at the module level. You deliver it to your customer. They optimize the board and they optimize somebody else optimizes the system and software and so on. I think the exciting thing about being in a, in a startup, um, uh, basically like Grok, 
is that not only can you optimize at the chip level, but really affect the entire vertical stack. So some of the biggest efforts right now are really um, co-optimization efforts all the way from the chip level to the software level. So uh, I have regular meetings with our software compiler group where we're actually figuring out how to basically optimize across that whole vertical stack. Um, so that is really exciting. Um, beyond that, I think that um, co-optimization will become almost essential as we move down to these more than more architectures, which have a lot of hazards like thermal budgets, uh, power supply noise budgets. That co-optimization is going to be critical to kind of enable the next generation of, of systems, which have reduced more, less and less margin so we can get more and more efficiency and deliver green uh, data centers that everybody is kind of pushing for. And I really am excited about that piece, um, especially. Yeah. Well, one of the things we love is competition here. Uh, we believe that it, it definitely is what drives great innovation. So it's been great to spend some time talking to Jonathan, speaking with you, learning about what Grok is doing. There's so many complexities with the you know, future development of AI, and it is going to solve so many of the world's biggest challenges. And I think you know, as we continue to sort of educate the market and the world, it is going to be a technological challenge, but it's gonna solve so many problems. And it just really excites me, Igor, and it excites me to see folks like you taking the risk, going from the, the big and the safe uh, and exciting to the fast and sometimes less <laughs> safe <laughs> environment. But that's where so much of our innovation in the world comes from. So congratulations on your move. Yep. Uh, congratulations on being the newest fellow at Grok. And uh, really appreciate you joining me here for this year's 6.5 Summit, Igor. We're going to have to have you back on in about a year or maybe even sooner because I want to hear how things are going. Sounds good, Daniel. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Absolutely.